Um, so thank you everybody for coming out tonight. Uh, this is uh, our affordable housing discussion. Um, as we'll go through a, a brief PowerPoint slideshow, um, not as much of a recap um, as, as in previous iterations. Uh, we do wanna try to make it brief. I'm sure there's plenty of people both in person and on Zoom that would like to make a comment or ask questions. Um, just keep in mind for the question and answer period, because we do have a pretty decent crowd and we do have some individuals online that we are gonna keep it to a brief um, sort of moment at the mic, ask a question. Once you're, once you're finished with your question or your comment, um, then we'll turn it over to the panelists that we will not engage in a dialogue and a back and forth. I think that that, that sort of runs into issues and, and timing issues. Uh, but certainly we want to hear from you and hear what you have uh, to say or have, what questions you might have. Um, I'm going to start out by just introducing the professionals and the panelists that are up here um, tonight. Uh, we ask that everybody who's involved in affordable housing uh, with the township uh, come tonight uh, to just make sure that we have a robust um, sort of uh, a panel. So I'll start with uh, first to my left is uh, Jared Cantor, who's the township's uh, affordable housing attorney. Richard Birch, who is uh, his associate in his firm, uh, also working on our affordable housing. Uh, Grant, <laughs> Graham Petto uh, with Topology, uh, the township planner. Beth McManus, uh, who is the uh, special planner for affordable housing. Joe Marazzini, uh, who is the township attorney and will be working on uh, the redevelopment uh, site with the 9 Main Street. And Robert Benneke, who is our financial consultant on that site as well. So everybody's here. Um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Graham um, to briefly go through uh, this presentation that we've presented. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I'm turning it over to Jared first. I have the outline right here and I'm following it. Um, so uh, we're going we're gonna to start with Jared, uh, who's going to speak to um, what's, what's already been done and, and what we're, uh, what we're, what's in front of us right now with the compliance hearing, which is on Wednesday. So, Jared. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Jared Cantor. I'm with the law firm of Anthony Cantor Rivera. Better? Yes? Okay. Sorry about that. So uh, I'm just going to give a, a brief background. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of what's been going on. So um, on April 19th, 2018, the Township of Millburg filed its declaratory act, uh, judgment action, seeking final judgment and compliance and repose for its affordable housing obligation. Um, and just to speed things along, there was a settlement agreement. Uh, which is largely what we're discussing tonight, uh, that was uh, authorized by the Township Committee on August 17th, 2021, by resolution at a public meeting. Um, the terms of that settlement agreement and the specific actions taken by, by the Township relating to that will be addressed in, in Mr. Petto's uh, slideshow, so I'm not going to get into all that because I think he'll do a great job of going through the actual terms of a settlement agreement and what's been accomplished. Um, I'm just going to go through some of the legalities very briefly. So following the settlement agreement, there's a requirement that there's a fairness hearing. Uh, that fairness hearing took place on January 28, 2022. That fairness hearing was done by through public notice. Um, residents or anyone had the uh, uh, residents or any objectors had the ability to come and appear at that fairness hearing. Um, you know, it's a, it's a publicly noticed meeting. Um, and a fairness hearing, the court is to determine whether or not um, the settlement agreement itself creates a realistic opportunity for the creation of affordable housing uh, pursuant to Milburn's constitutional responsibilities under the Mount Little Doctrine. Um, at that time, I believe residents were heard. This predates my retention, but residents were heard on the terms of the settlement agreement, and those terms were addressed at that fairness hearing. Um, the court ultimately uh, approved the settlement agreement at that fairness hearing um, by a later dated order. Um, on November 29, 2022, uh, our firm was retained. Um, at that time, there was a compliance hearing scheduled for December 16th. I'm going to get into a couple of other things. That was, and it's, it's been, when we, we were retained, we asked to have that compliance hearing adjourned um, so we could review the file, um, so we can get with the town council and our clients. Um, and so you have seen me at some, some public meetings. Um, and it was actually rescheduled for February 28th, which was the only day it snowed this year. So it got adjourned to uh, April 19th, which is this Wednesday. 
So I'll get into the compliance hearing, um, but there's a few other things that are being taking place on Wednesday that I think are very significant to the residents uh, of Milburn, and I think it's worth noting. So uh, again, you know, predating our attention, but in July, um, Fair Share Housing Corporation um, filed what's called a motion aid in litigants' rights. And it doesn't really matter what the motion is called, but they were saying that Milburn was not compliant with the obligations within the settlement agreement. And they were seeking some pretty drastic remedies against the township of Milburn, um, including stripping Milburn of its immunity, which is basically what we're trying to seek here. Um, if you have a con you have a constitutional obligation to provide affordable housing, if we don't have the appropriate affordable housing, it allows developers to come in and basically, basically create their own zoning um, and create dense housing and the township loses control. So one remedy they sought was stripping uh, our immunities. Um, another, another remedy they sought was the appointment of a special hearing officer and monitor um, to oversee the, the nine Main Street project. That would, that would all be done at the cost of Milburn residents at a high cost. Um, in addition to their fees. Um, so, so since our, so I'm happy to say that that motion was pending. It was pending even in February. Um, as of today, I can report to the residents of Milburn um, that we've successfully negotiated almost everything in that uh, aid motion, aid and litigants rights. Um, fair share housing is going to be either withdrawing its, its application, but substantively it's going to be withdrawn. Um, there's one outstanding issue, which is fees in this kind of, in this types of cases of fee shift. And given the fact that Fairshire Housing had to file a motion to compel uh, the Township of Milburn to complete these tasks, uh, they're entitled to fees. And we're kind of have, we're, I can't get into everything because it's being heard Wednesday. And we have some, uh, you know, obviously we have some litigation issues and we don't want to reveal everything we're going to argue at that hearing. But I can tell you that Fairshire Housing is seeking fees. Um, and, and there's some opposition to the amount of fees that Fairshire Housing will be obtaining. Um, but but they're no longer seeking these extraordinary remedies um, at this time. So the motion was largely resolved. So I think that's a very positive step uh, for the township. In addition, again, these are things that are going to be decided on Wednesday, in addition to the compliance hearing, which I'll get to. Um, Woodmont Properties, um, they have a motion in aid, in aid and litigants' rights too. Um, without getting into too much detail, they don't believe that our ordinance uh, lived up to the terms of settlement agreement. Um, one of the major issues um, in Woodmont's motion was they thought they had the right to rooftop amenities at their properties, which were not zoned. Um, the Township of Milburn took action, I believe, last month and adopted an ordinance um, eliminating the ability for, for rooftop amenities throughout the township. So that part of that motion will, will no longer be heard. And the other two issues are just deal with some wording in the ordinance, um, which the court will have to decide. Um, we also have a motion filed by a group called Concerned Milburn Residents. Um, they're seeking to intervene in the action, um, and that's being opposed by the township as well. Um, so, well, I mean, there's a laugh, but I'm not, I can't give, you know, their attorney is sitting in the audience, so I'm not going to obviously go into all the strategy that goes into uh, defending that motion. Um, the compliance hearing, um, the compliance hearing is very simple and straightforward. We have a settlement agreement that the court has already deemed to be fair. What's that issue at the compliance hearing is whether or not the township has complied with the settlement agreement. It's no longer a debate as to the terms of the settlement agreement. We've already agreed to them. We've signed the agreement. It's already been approved by the court. It's what it's have we complied with those terms. Um, so we're not seeking full compliance because we still have a couple outstanding issues, uh, which will which will be addressed by Graham. Um, largely dealing with uh, the 75 unit project, um, but we'll be seeing what's called a conditional compliance. Um, and I think um, other than a few outstanding issues, the court's likely to grant us our conditional compliance, which I think is a big step with Milburn. Um, it's a lot has taken place in a positive um, way since um, this the end of the year. Um, you know, we, we work cooperatively. Um, so that's basically what's going on in the compliance hearing. Um, there are a few objections uh, that were filed. Um, they were addressed by the township. Um, again, uh, without getting into too much legalities, the objection has to go to Milburn's compliance with the settlement agreement 
not the terms of the settlement agreement itself. That was dealt with at the fairness hearing, um, which again predated our retention. Um, but regardless, um, the court is not, the court has indicated it's not going to be taking arguments um, as to the fairness of the agreement, meeting the terms of the agreement, which were previously agreed to and approved by the court. Um, so, unless Alex, you have anything else you'd like me to address. Um, so, thank you. And obviously, I'm going to be here for questions. Uh, with that, I'll turn it over to Graham Petto, who's going to go over just a brief review of the settlement terms as well as what's been completed today. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, as Mr. McDonald said, uh, my name is Graham Petto. I'm principal of topology and I serve as the township planner. Um, so uh, I have a prepared presentation to kind of walk, walk everyone through um, the compliance um, with the settlement agreement, as Mr. Cantor did discuss. Um, provide a status as to where that is and uh, preview what, what's ahead on the 100% of the 75 unit project. Sorry, I just want to I just want to make sure we share the screen for those uh, viewing it. Oh. Okay, um, so I'm going to talk through the compliance mechanisms, um, and they're not necessarily in order, but I'll just touch on them, uh, and then we'll kind of go through the status with respect to each of those. Um, so the first is the 100% affordable 75 unit development uh, located at 9 Main Street. Um, this is settlement term number 12, uh, as I've shown here on the bottom of the screen. This is the, ex the exact language from the settlement agreement, um, which notes that Milburn shall sponsor 100% affordable development of at least 75 new family non e restricted rental units within the township. Um, and the um, settlement terms go on to expound upon the site of this uh, location that it should be a, a portion of the DPW lot. Um, there's uh, excessive detail within the settlement agreement around this term. Uh, the next compliant mechanism that I just wanted to touch on uh, are the overlay zones, the zoning requirements. Uh, this is uh, settlement term number nine. Uh, the township um, and fair share housing center agreed to place overlay zoning on the following properties at the prescribed residential densities and requiring a 20% uh, a set aside of affordable housing, as you see here, uh, that constituted uh, the Canuber Country Club area, uh, the B2 zone, uh, sorry, this is over here, B2 zone, um, and then the B2 zone on Milburn Avenue uh, between Merle and Essex, a B4 zone, CMO zone, and the OR1 zone. Uh, one lot within the OR1 zone. Um, and then the settlement agreement also contains a number of other compliance mechanisms. Uh, these other components include a few uh, site specific development projects, um, administrative and mandatory set aside uh, ordinance, uh, adoption of a housing element and fair share plan, adoption of a spending plan, um, and then also an affirmative marketing plan or other required com uh, components of the settlement agreement that the township needed to enact. Um, just a locational map just to show the site specific development locations that were identified um, as part of the settlement agreement. These include uh, the Woodmont properties out on JFK Parkway, um, the Silverman uh, group, uh, the DPW uh, properties here, the Wells Fargo site, um, and then the Annie Set property as well, and also the Upton. Um, these are uh, site specific developments to help um, meet uh, compliance. So, next, uh, this slide is to um, kind of provide an overview of. Um, the status of compliance with respect to a number of different areas um, and the corresponding date of adoption by the Township Committee uh, and with planning board and the corresponding resolution number that uh, approved that, that component. Um, so as you can see, the B2 overlay zone was adopted uh, by the Township Committee uh, on July 19, 2022, under Ordinance 2606-22. Uh, the zoning overlay uh, for the B4 zone was adopted on July 19, 2022, also uh, same date, uh, under Ordinance 2607-22. The CMO zone overlay uh, was also adopted July 19, 2022, under 2605-22. The OR1 uh, zone overlay also adopted July 19, 2022, under 2604-22. Uh, the Canuber Country Club overlay um, was adopted March 7, 2023, under uh, Ordinance 2633-23. Um, the JFK Woodmont site overlay was adopted by the township November 9th, 2021, under ordinance number 2585-21. Um, and then the site-specific developments, uh, Chatham Road Woodland was adopted uh, September 17th, 2019, under ordinance 
uh, 2542-19. Uh, the RMF page two, which is for the Wells Fargo site, um, that uh, ordinance was adopted July 14, 2020, uh, under 2557-20. Uh, RMF page four, which is the zoning overlay for the Annie Says property that was adopted November 9th, 2021, uh, under ordinance 2593-21. Um, and then, of course, 9 Main Street, 100% um, 75 unit project um, is ongoing at this point. Uh, as Mr. Cantor alluded to, that is one of the um, projects that is uh, not yet compliant, but we've been working in progress. Uh, other relevant ordinances um, and plans, administrative processes. Uh, that, that the township has already implemented uh, pursuant to the settlement agreement include adoption of the housing element fair share plan, which was adopted by the planning board um, on July 20th, 2022. Um, and the township committee recognized that adoption um, and confirmed that adoption by the planning board uh, on February 7th, 2023. Um, and the township committee did that uh, by resolution 23-065. The spending plan uh, for the affordable housing trust fund was adopted by the township committee by resolution on February 7th, 2023, under resolution 23-067. Uh, the affirmative marketing, marketing plan was adopted on March 1st, 2022, under resolution 22-087. Um, the affordable housing mandatory set-aside ordinance, uh, which is located within the zoning and requires 20% of new units created to be set aside for affordable housing, uh, that was adopted by ordinance on April 5th, 2022. Uh, under ordinance 2596-22 and 2597-22. Um, and then the development fee ordinance, uh, which requires collection of affordable housing trust fund fees uh, for all uh, certain types of development. Um, that was uh, adopted by ordinance by the Township Committee May 17, 2022, under uh, ordinance 2600-22. Um, and as you can see, all of these, um, the Y indicates that this has been completed uh, as a, a requirement. So next, I've, uh, I've prepared this slide just to kind of summarize uh, the outreach that um, the township has done that we have done um, to date um, throughout this process. Um, the township held three public information sessions, um, August 17, 2021, uh, January 10, 2022, and March 10, 2022 uh, on affordable housing. Um, and we're going to have this presentation linked. Each of these is a hyperlink to the meeting recording or proceedings so you can see uh, the meetings. Um, figured that was a nice place to put this all together. Um, with respect to 9 Main Street uh, and the development of the 75 unit 100% affordable project, um, there was a presentation that was done to the Township Committee back on November 9th, 2021. Um, then, uh, apology, we posted an online design survey for residents to provide input. Um, that was open from April 18th to May 3rd last year, just about a year ago. Uh, we received 635 responses to that survey uh, regarding design, other sustainability features, or uh, open space components, um, things that we were looking for. Uh, feedback from the community on regarding the design of that project. We then also hosted um, a hybrid um, in-person and virtual design workshop on uh, April 26, 2022. Um, we had 15 uh, folks attend in person and 40 attend virtually. We had a split breakout um, for both sets of participants and received a lot of good uh, feedback on different components of the project as well. With respect to the affordable housing uh, overlay zoning ordinances, um, we held two roundtable discussions, one in person on May 3rd, 2022, um, and then a virtual presentation on May 5th, uh, 2022. Um, we also presented to the planning board uh, the affordable housing overlays uh, for their consistency review, and then also gave a presentation July 19th, uh, at which uh, many of these overlays were adopted. Um, and also there was a public hearing on the housing element fair share plan. Um, Ms. McManus uh, presented the plan to the planning board, and a public hearing was available for residents uh, to provide comments on the plan. Okay, so I wanted to shift um, focus now to the outreach summary for uh, 9 Main Street. This is an end of um, that project. Um, and just kind of summarize the public outreach components that we did uh, last year um, to discuss uh, that project. As I indicated earlier, this is the last remaining compliance item uh, that, outstand that is outstanding for the township at this time. Um, so we wanted to summarize the efforts that we've done so far. So as part of the outreach process, we asked participants to provide input on a variety of design considerations. Um, the first was, um, Kind of identifying, uh, you know, what is what's a design uh, that is, you know, consistent or you know, really tells the story of Milburn, the existing downtown community. Um, so we provided these uh, precedent images um, to kind of help folks identify, you know, what they best, what what image best represents what they think uh, of when they think of downtown. 
um, as part of the outreach process, we also um, you know, presented some precedent images and some suggestive design ideas um, and asked for resident input on you know, what, what, if, what type of building speaks to them and what they feel you know, is important uh, as far as windows, uh, materials, uh, massing, setbacks, setbacks, uh, other different types of treatments um, with respect to designing uh, this project in the downtown. We also discussed sustainability features and sought input for residents, um, you know, with respect to green roofs, bikes, uh, electric vehicles, charging, um, you know, what different types of components would be important um, in the nine main street project um, within the downtown. Um, and then we also talked about uh, open space improvements. Um, the building will be set back uh, uh, sufficiently from the um, uh, curb line to allow for a small open space plaza at the front of the building. Um, we talked about programming of that space, what types of features, a path to the park, benches, other types of things um, within that space. So we provided some precedent images around that. Um, we discussed many streetscape concerns and issues regarding circulation, uh, the high volume of pedestrian traffic in this area, and uh, the importance of kind of mitigating those situations. Um, we summarized our findings and provided a report, which I believe is also available on the um, affordable housing website. Um, it, it, um, and it summarized what we heard. So we heard, you know, varied, um, in, inconsistent perspective, uh, perception of existing downtown character. Some folks felt that there is a defining character of downtown. Others felt that there was not. Um, and then we discussed, you know, many different, we saw many different desires for, for specific design elements. Um, as we start to consider the building. Um, so first was a step back of the top floor from the front side, um, varied building materials and roof line um, with masonry as the primary material. Sidewalk street sheets should match uh, the downtown or paper and playoffs design to kind of keep that space from the downtown area. Uh, preserve that public open space in the front of the building, uh, screen the residential amenity space and incorporate sustainable design, including stormwater management and electric parking. Um, so current status, um, we are work in the process of developing a redevelopment plan for the site uh, to effectuate uh, construction of the Nine Main Street uh, uh, building. Um, the redevelopment plan is incorporating all this public feedback that we heard, which is uh, helping to kind of craft the, the vision for the site. Um, the redevelopment plan will help facilitate development of the concept plan, uh, provide for those public improvements, and address the public feedback. Uh, the redevelopment agreement uh, will be executed with the developer, which will detail all the requirements and ensure that they follow um, the requirements set forth in the plan document. Uh, next steps regarding the redevelopment plan, um, there will be an introduction uh, presentation at the Township Committee of the redevelopment plan um, for uh, you know, the benefit of the Township Committee and residents as well. Uh, the planning board will conduct a review of the redevelopment plan to ensure consistency with the Township Master Plan and provide a report back um, to the Township Committee, uh, where they will uh, execute final adoption of the redevelopment plan. Uh, following that, there will be execution of the redeveloper agreement, um, and then the applicant, uh, the developer, can proceed to site plan and subdivision uh, approval uh, at the planning board. Okay, I'm just going to ask um, Joe and Bob to just touch a little bit on the redevelopment process and how the um, municipally sponsored 100% affordable developments um, are done financially. So there's a little bit of understanding behind that as well. So I don't know, Bob you, or Joe, you want to start real quick? Okay. Good evening, I'm Joe Marazzini, uh, firm of Marazzini Falcon. Uh, my role here uh, is with respect to the preparation negotiation of the redevelopment agreement for uh, the affordable housing project, 100% of the affordable housing project. And I want to start out uh, with the question of where did RPN come from? And that goes back uh, to a very competitive procurement process that involved a, uh, an RFP, an RFQ, uh, and it was done twice. Uh, there were uh, uh, several that were finalists in that, and as a result of that process, RPM was selected. And the Township Committee adopted a conditional designation resolution, conditionally designate, designating RPM as the developer of the site 
conditioned upon the successful negotiation of a, of a, of a developer agreement. We were originally thinking of a developer's agreement until we heard from Mr. Beneke, who will be describing in more detail the financial issues here. He pointed out that the financial tools that come by way of a redevelopment project would be more beneficial to the township. So as Graham mentioned, we're in the process of going forward with that redevelopment process. And I'll just describe what that process is within my remaining four minutes, maybe. Um, it, it starts with the declaring the area to be in need of redevelopment. That was done um, in 2006. It included not only the site we're talking about, not only the DPW site, but the, a, a broad area around the existing municipal building was declared to be an area in need of, of redevelopment. In, in uh, March of 2001, uh, there was an update of that designation of uh, concluding that the, ter ter the 21, excuse me, thank you. In, in March of 2021, an update was done that concluded that the conditions had largely unchanged and so that the criteria were still met. The next step is the development of a, a redevelopment plan, which Graham outlined, that will uh, be adopted by ordinance, but only after uh, it is first submitted to the planning board for the planning board to make a determination as to whether it is consistent with the master plan. The next step is the, the step that uh, is the key step, in my opinion, and that is the redevelopment agreement. The redevelopment plan, as distinguished from the agreement, is an outline, a general concept uh, of what the idea of the redevelopment for the area will be. All of the details uh, then get blended into a redevelopment agreement, which will set forth the project <clears throat> description in, in great detail, exactly what it is, uh, is going to be built by RPM, a project schedule. Uh, it will include a, a, uh, uh, a period of due diligence because as been mentioned and many times that the site is contaminated. It is not a dump site as, as has been often referred to. It is a contaminated site. There are contaminated sites all over New Jersey that are then redeveloped for residential use. Our firm represents uh, municipalities from Carney's Point Asbury Park, uh, Ringwood, many places, and there are many areas of the state uh, where uh, redevelopment areas are, are transformed with redevelopment of, with residential projects. As long as the site is cleaned up to the uh, NJDEP res residential standards, there will be an opportunity for the developer, uh, RPM, to do due diligence and go further uh, if it chooses to do so in terms of the environmental uh, examination of the site. The uh, redevelopment agreement will also contain the financing plan, which will be further described by Bob Beneke. It will contain also a termination of the full remedy provisions. It's about a 100-page document plus a number of exhibits. So that's the general concept. I'll be happy to answer questions uh, as they arise. Thank you. Well, just a few minutes, so that's what I'll do. My name is Bob Benneke. The firm's name is Benneke Economics. Ask me any questions anytime. Um, it's not a problem. Um, just by way of background, uh, I'm the guy that wrote the book on uh, public finance in New Jersey and the state accounting system for um, budgets. If you look at your town budget, you'll see this little column that says that's CLA, this flexible chart of accounts, that's the accounting system. I wrote it. In any event, um, we had been engaged by the township approximately a year ago to evaluate the RPM proposal and to make sure that their numbers were correct 
and that their proposal was in sync with the market. Obviously, the market's changing every day, and as we come into the 2023 construction period, we're seeing an escalation again in certain cost areas. This year is more so in labor. In any event, the, the way that this project gets financed, or any of these 100% or near 100% inclusionary projects get financed, there's two foundational principles. One is the New Jersey Housing Mortgage Finance Agency providing for loans to these types of uh, products, these types of projects. Number two is something called LIHTC, it's Low Income Housing Tax Credits, L-I-H-T-C. Low Income Housing Tax Credits is, is a very boring subject. When you Google it online, you'll see what happens. What happens is that you have a developer who has a certain cost bucket and that bucket then is brokered to developers that have a taxable consequence. You know, you all, you all know the major stock companies, Toll Brothers, DR Horton, Bryant Homes, and the like. So they'll take that cost, give the money into the affordable housing project, if you will, or invest the money, and then they'll write that off on their taxes and have a tax credit. That's the way that works, essentially. It's a lot more complicated than that. To distill it down, that's exactly the way it works. So those are the two principles. After those two principles, then you have what's called a deferred developer's uh, fee. The developer's fee doesn't come out until the end when permanent financing is in place by the New Jersey Housing Mortgage Finance Agency. And then number four is any gap that exists is public financing of one sort or another. Last year, it ended, actually in mid-January, the regs just came out, what's called a Affordable Housing Production Fund. It's a new piece of legislation, $305 million, that's designed to take these types of projects and help fund what's called the gap. The gap is the difference between those principal foundational financing points and you know, what's, what's needed to make the project more profitable and cover the costs. So that is by the legislature, that's done by the legislature. Those rigs just came out in January. That's another source of funding. And then finally, there's something new that's called an Aspire program. It used to be the Economic Recovery Growth uh, Grants, ERGS for short, and they've now morphed into an Aspire program. The Aspire program came out with their regs about a year and a half ago. Unfortunately, there were no applications until this past um, winter, and one of the Brunswick major project was funded using that recently. And now the legislature is actually changing the rules and the laws, and these types of projects will also have eligibility under that program. So you have those five um, capital stack components, if you will. In addition, the redevelopment program and the redevelopment planning process allows for various other tools. For example, the New Jersey Housing Mortgage Finance Agency requires a pilot payment in lieu of tax program. It's not the payment in lieu of tax program per se that we all know and um, are familiar with in terms of um, regular projects, if you will, market rate projects. It's more towards a limited div dividend affordable housing type of program that the NJHMFA requires. As a matter of fact, the NJHMFA program requires a maximum, maximum 6.28% on a pilot. The redevelopment process helps get you at that, it increases your score to qualify and the project to qualify for things like the NJHMFA loans, like the Aspire grant, et cetera. And that's why we recommended that, provided that the township was moving along those lines, that they use that um, redevelopment planning process to effectuate the toolkit that we can employ uh, with this project. It's a great project, 75 units, round figures, it's going to cost 30 plus million dollars. Um, if you just do the math, it's $400,000 a unit, give or take. And it, it's, it's a very um, great undertaking. And the environmentals, as Mr. Maricidi indicated, will be taken care of. So that's it. Thanks. Thank okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you all for, for the, your portion of the presentation. Just like to say uh, thanks to everybody online too for being patient with us. Uh, this is the first attempt uh, that we've made to uh, bring uh, Zoom into the library. You know, we, we've uh, we've kind of created our own system here. 
Um, so there's some bugs to work out, um, but I understand that the screen sharing, you weren't able to view those that were presenting. So our apologies there. Um, okay, so with that, um, we're gonna just open it up to Q and A. What I'm gonna ask though, is that um, one, uh, we have, looks to be about 75 in the room or 50 in the room, and we have about 74 on, on, on online. Um, so please keep your comments or your questions limited. Um, we'll certainly do our best to answer them after you've said them and you've sat down and so that we can sort of keep this flow going and not get into a back and forth that that will 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 sort of take away from time that people may want to ask questions or make a comment. Um, just I know this is a sensitive topic um, and I know that um, you know uh, there is some passion about it in one way or another. I'm just going to ask that everybody be um, respectful and kind in what they're what they're doing. Um, it, it, it is not going to serve us well as a community to uh, to to to, to uh, sort of go at one another. But uh, I think if we can have an open dialogue and sort of answer your questions and be able to have a discussion about this, uh, that is that is a good thing. Um, and so with that, I'll open this mic first. I'll take the requisite amount of time to try to get through the people that want to make a comment here. Um, and then we will open it up to um, th those that are participating on Zoom. So at this time on Zoom, if you do want to make a comment, please raise your hand. That will give us a sense of how many people on Zoom do want to make a comment. Um, and then uh, we'll, we'll go from there. All right. Anybody in the room? Thanks, Alex. Thanks, uh, team, I guess, professionals. Um, my name is Ben Stoller. I've been a resident for quite some time, four kids, two just graduated in, at relative schools, good schools, a uh, child in high school and a child in sixth grade. Um, everything that you guys are discussing up here sounds structurally correct, but what I believe you guys are missing is the decision to actually put 75 units on a contaminated site. And we've had this discussion. I know the site will be cleaned up, but everyone talks about morality. They talk about doing the right thing in this day and age. Why are we gonna put 75 families squeezed between a train station and an tr electrical transformer, the busiest road I've ever seen on Short Hills Road coming down from the middle school and on a contaminated site. It just doesn't seem right to me. You're talking about all the structural things that we put in place financially, et cetera, but the town council opted to do this in a vacuum. They didn't reach out before any of these decisions were made to understand what happens in the environment. What happens to the, what's happening financially, what's happening from a schooling system. We're gonna put 75 families there. They're gonna have two, three kids a piece estimate. Their education level needs to be brought up. Who's going to, how does that get done? We want these guys, people to thrive in our community. That's what we're. We want a community that's open to everyone. I was at the middle school, my budding little thespian, 11 year old, I was in a high school musical. The feeling was fantastic. We had everybody together, young families all working together in unison to make it a very successful production. It was fantastic. What a great feeling that was. Same thing in the high schools. I cannot say enough about this community. We moved here for two, for three reasons, education, crime, or safety, lack thereof, and location, close to Manhattan. Uh, so this whole idea, right, Ben, can I just interrupt? Because uh, I understand everybody wants to acknowledge their agreement with Mr. Stoller, but Let's just keep the clapping and applause to a minimum. That'll help things move along. So one of the questions, you know, in terms of outreach to affordable housing recipients, has anybody reached out? How do you feel about being on that dump wedge between the transformer and the train station? No one's reached out. No one's worked with the Board of Education. No one's done a municipal study on traffic. No one's done a flood study. No one's done a, a civil services study on crime. Uh, it's just not been done. This is the most ill-prepared project I've ever seen in my life. And I do a lot of building across the world uh, in terms of companies, uh, but to do this in this vacuum to me makes zero sense. So I basically have a couple of questions. One, directly from Mr. Marazzini, uh, it's gonna come, can this project been stopped now? Structurally, I understand it's fine, but can the town do anything to stop it at this point? 
on top of that, on top of that, you know, these are, here's a quote, and I'm going to read this quote. It's funny. There is no responsibility for a municipality to address its entire unmet need, as this almost always never happens. Rather, the focus should be on whether the township has made reasonable efforts to incentivize inclusionary development in appropriate places. Well, that quote sounds fantastic. I love that quote. It's from Mr. Cantor. Yet he tells <laughs> our compliance officials that we have to meet this unmet need. It makes zero sense to me. It's basically double speak. And then really the last piece I just want to say is this pilot program. Bob, you wrote a book, fantastic. Oh, five. We, but that's five right. books, fantastic. Right. <laughs> everything you're saying, everything you're saying is spot on. But what you're not doing is including all the ancillary costs, the education, because we did a school age children study in education. Okay, course. and that's been presented to residents. No, it was presented to the okay, council. Well, and it's in plus. It's not funny, it's in plus. Okay, well, we want to see a town, we want to see a study financially of what the outcome on our town is. And, and you know, financially, I'm all for affordable housing. I want it everywhere. But let's do it correctly. Let's do it practically, methodically financially feasible and do it for the benefit of those participants who are receiving it, not in a vacuum where we're going to be, it's immoral to do what we're doing and then don't. And, you know, whoever, however we get there, we get there, but I think it should be done in a practical manner. So the three questions, financial, Mr. Cantor, talking double speak, and Mr. Mayor Thank you. Good evening. So, so it, it, it's not double speed. So just put that quote into context. This is a situation where we have a settlement agreement that's been signed and an identified development within that settlement agreement, which the township's complying with. That quote came from a development that was not in the settlement agreement that was trying to uh, enter, that is trying to intervene and be part of the settlement agreement that wasn't named. I mean, I mean, you've read the settlement agreement. I see you've read a lot. This project is in your settlement agreement and in detail with dates and, and, and milestones and uh, Fair Share Housing Corporation is trying to enforce a settlement agreement that they entered into. That quote, although thank you for thinking it was well written, um, it's just an opposite to the, to the issues before Milburn. That's the question to me as to whether it can be changed. And I, I will defer to Jared about this, but uh, this is a part of a court order. This, the township has been ordered by a court to implement this program. Right. I changing it would require convincing the court to change it. I, I, I appreciate your. Well, you wanted to rebut, but like, look, you know, again, well, the, the, question for, the other question was on the morality of the issue. Has anybody looked at that and done outreach the, to participants that will actually be living there? So the township currently has um, one building that has portable housing in it, is right? Is that hundred percent inclusionary or? Uh, no, that that's the opt-in that has thirty units. Um, so I'm, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit. I'm a little bit confused by the question, quite honestly, in terms of how uh, we're surveying individuals that are going to uh, to possibly live there. Um, I think that in terms of a development like this, too, I want to just be very, I guess, cautious with the way that we characterize um, a, a few things. One is, in particular, that we continue to call it a dump as a community. Now, yes, I understand that we go through an action of going to that DPW site and taking our stuff there, but it is not a dump. No, you said dump multiple times. Anyway, so excuse me, excuse me. So one, for, for this to work, right? You're gonna ask a question, we're gonna speak. If it's not gonna work that way, then we can end this, this discussion right now because that is the only way that this is going to work. You're question. being hostile. Right off the bat, you're being hostile. I'm not being hostile. Yes, you are. I, I, this is the community talking to you. I understand that. So let them talk. I understand. You're stopping that from talking to the a lawyer. This is not going to work. You're not helping. No, it's also not going to work. I have a question. I would love to hear it. Thank you. And I appreciate everyone's interest in, in this topic because 
it's important. And I also appreciate as a taxpayer, our paid professionals who are helping us navigate through this. Uh, that said, I do have a question about the nine Main Street projects specifically, and I'll entertain anyone's responses, whoever's appropriate. And uh, so excuse my naivete, I'm, I'm not a real estate man, I'm not a financial guy. So some of these questions may sound naive, but I think maybe other people in the room are thinking the same thing. During the presentation on 9 Main Street, it seemed to me that this project was going to be financed by the township with all the mortgage agreements and the New Jersey grants, which is different than what I originally thought was going to be financed by a builder, and we were going to give the land away for a dollar. Now, maybe that's just my ignorance, but that's what I was originally thinking. This is a change. So question number one, is the, is the township becoming a property owner of this Prop 9 Main Street project and, and, and with all the responsibilities and obligations, therefore? Secondly, what's the composition of the residents of this 9 Main Street if we are going to be the owners? I'd like to know who are we renting to? Are these going to be Section 8? Yeah. Are these going to be somewhere in the middle? Are these going to be a mixture or a blend? And I'd like to know specific numbers because I know that a lot of there's a lot of misunderstandings amongst the citizenry of who's going to be in this building. And if and are they going to pay taxes on this four hundred thousand dollars per unit through their in their rent to our township, or is the township going to absorb the costs of this project in the term in terms of schools taxes and, and sewer taxes and garbage pickup taxes and other costs that, quite, quite frankly, your, your analysis may not have included going forward with time. And lastly, if we are going to be a build a owner of this building as a township, as taxpayers, what's the return on our investment? Is the, is it going to is this going to is this going to is this going to generate income that's going to come back to the township, or is this going to be or a, a, a net loss and increased taxes for all of us? Thank you. And, I, and those are the questions I like to ask. So. So, so there's you know a lot to unpack there understand your concern the first issue is with respect to who's going to live there it's going to be marketed the project towards low and moderate income persons on a scale that the statute it's actually a regulation uniform housing affordability controls prescribes those those pers those those prescriptions are done in the, the, the statute. And generally, we use about 35% of market rents for the rentals of the apartment units for affordables, 100% inclusionary. So if you rent at $40 a square foot for a market, it's going to be renting about $14 to $16 a square foot on average. Depends upon family size, and it depends upon income, income criteria, and in what's called the region that we're in, in our, our catchment region of Essex counties, not just Melbourne, Essex, and other counties. That's number one. Number two is that the site will be cleaned up to residential site improvement standards. There's actually in New Jersey several, and in New York and in Pennsylvania, several apartment and residential properties that are built actually on landfills. It's act, there's actually a method for doing that. Air filtration is controls, it's all sorts of testing, there's pilings, there's raising of buildings. Happens all the time in Manhattan, Brooklyn, and various environments in New Jersey. So that that's not uncommon. Not common, but it's not uncommon either. Second is that there's generally no profit out of 100% inclusionary projects. That's why you have the low income housing tax credit. Therefore, the taxes are generally on the lower side is who payment lieu of tax. That payment lieu of tax is a maximum of 6.28% of your rent. So if you think of 14 to $16 a square feet, square foot, you're, you're basically paying 6.28% maximum of taxes on that. And it's done through a cash flow stream. The reason for that is that obviously these are affordable housing complexes and the, the, the people are strapped and the households are strapped and they're trying to build their way to a better future. Therefore, you have that income strap. That's why you have the federal government coming in with the low income housing tax credit. That's why you have the New Jersey Housing Mortgage Finance Agency giving preferable loans. And that's why you have things like the Affordable Housing Production Fund and the Aspire grants coming through. To answer your question, the township 
Alex and the team that you see here gave us the charge of attempting not to have any taxpayer infused dollars into the capital stack from the local property taxpayer, maybe around the edges for some fees, maybe for some muscle, but not in terms of direct infusion. Our original plan last year through RPM was to fund the gap through a some sort of financing of structured financing by Mr. Kelly. That's now off the table. We've we've convinced RPM to use the housing affordable affordable housing production fund and the Aspire grant to fill that gap instead. And they are agreeing to that, provided that we help them with it. We've done quite a bit of the, this work and we will help them with that so that the taxpayer doesn't pay directly. Because there is no profit and because there are low rents, I would suspect that as with a lot of homes out there that pay $20,000 a year in taxes and have four kids in school, and those kids are on, on average cost $25,000 to, to educate a year, that's $100,000 you're paying $20,000. I'm not gonna say only because that's a lot of money, but 30,000 even, it's a lot of money, or 40,000 even. So a lot of properties are upside down, a lot of properties pay extra, for example, commercial properties. So there's, it's a balancing act. The, the legislature is specific and the courts are specific, they're very specific, and correct me if I'm wrong, very specific, that cost of services, while it's important, is not a weighty matter before the courts when it comes to production of affordable housing, because of just that same reason that I just indicated. It's all over the place. So I on the ball is reduce the property tax load, try to get the best product you can, the ownership issue these folks have to answer in terms of when the, the town would take over the property if there's a reverter clause. That's all in play, but it's actually irrelevant because it's a let me load. have the clock. It's a cash flow. I'm answering his question. Right. Answer his question. Good evening. My name is Jerry Collins. I'm a resident. Um, I'd first like to start out by thanking the professionals for finally hosting this session. I, I want to say finally because you pointed out that there was a compliance hearing back in February, but the session wasn't planned for prior to that compliance hearing in February when the snowstorm happened. So I'm curious as to what's changed. Um, I think it's a little bit disrespectful that none of our TC members are here tonight. Maybe they're on Zoom. Um, but I believe uh, the individuals on the TC who negotiated this, Mayor Maggie Miggins and Richard Wasserman, should at least have the courage to show their faces in public tonight, um, just because I think there are some very controversial elements of the settlement agreement. Um, in response to Mr. Stoller's question, uh, Attorney Cantor stated that we're doing this project because it's part of our settlement agreement. Um, and, you know, thank you, Graham, for walking through us that, through that presentation at the beginning, but what you failed to mention is that there's two parts of each municipality's affordable housing obligation. The first part is the RDP, the realistic development potential. The second part is the unmet need. Now, towns must satisfy their RDP, the first part. That's all in the settlement agreement. The 100%, and I'm going to call it 100% exclusionary because it's income segregation, the 75 unit project at the DPW site. That's part of our unmet need. And as Mr. Stoller pointed out, quote that Mr. Cantor said for Livingston, municipalities are not required to satisfy parts of their unmet need. So I think this community deserves an answer as to why this project is part of our agreement as part of the unmet need. And to be clear, I'm going to say this because I've asked this at multiple public forums, including the second planning board uh, passage of the housing element and fair share plan, where I asked this exact question, and thank you for being here today, Ms. McManus, but your response, you stated, West Orange, I see that they have, or I know that they have, a 100% affordable housing site as part of their unmet need. Now, I actually went back and I looked at this. So West Orange does have 64 units of 100% affordable age-restricted housing planned for the library site. Now, interestingly enough, interestingly enough, uh, 17 of those units are credited towards the RDP, and the remainder is towards the unmet need. So the question here is, why are all 75 units of that DPW project contributing to the unmet need, which again, we do not have to satisfy as a municipality? Can you please answer that question? And this time, please actually give us an example of other towns um, that are using 
at least 75 units of 100% affordable units, all of them, none towards the RDB, all towards the unmet need. Um, can you give us an example of that? Because I believe our project, um, it's at least 42 units an acre. The site is contaminated. It doesn't make any sense. I think a lot of people here deserve an answer as to why we agreed to that in our settlement agreement. Um, I have an, another question, a sort of follow-up question. I noticed in our settlement agreement that we are allowed to have up to 29 age-restricted units. And I, I believe if you do the computation correctly, because I can test what's actually in the settlement agreement, I think we're actually entitled to up to 49 age-restricted units. So could you please explain why our town is not taking advantage of these age-restricted units, given that there's a critical shortage of senior housing in this area? So I, I think our community deserves an answer to that. Um, I have many more things to talk about, but I've been chasing an answer to this question for the better part of eight months. I've asked it at six township committee meetings, maybe more actually, the second planning board meeting, and I still don't have an answer. So could you please give us an answer tonight? Thank you. Yeah. Why is that? For campus, for campus, right? It's not for me. I, I didn't go to the settlement. I mean, I don't think he cares who answers it, but it goes to the nation of the settlement agreement, which I wasn't a part of. So I'm going to turn it over to somebody else. Yeah, it's all the only one person who is involved now. Well, yeah, but you're involved now with the compliance. No, I'm involved with it. The question was, why was the 75 unit included in the settlement agreement? I'm telling my my position has been that because it's included in the settlement agreement, we executed it, that we have to be in compliance with our settlement agreement. I, I, I didn't get into why the 75 unit was included in the settlement agreement. But if you want to hear me talk, I mean, I don't want to filibuster and be accused of running out the clock, but I don't have the answer. That's his answer. There's no answer. No. So, folks, just as a refresher, my name is Beth McManus. I'm the Township's Affordable Housing Plan. I was involved in the settlement negotiations. Uh, I guess the question wasn't directly towards me, but I probably have the most firsthand knowledge of folks up here. Um, the 75 unit unmet, the 75 unit 100% project as part of our unmet need. That was included in our settlement agreement as part of the ongoing negotiations with Fair Share Housing Center. And due to the nature of, the, of really any litigation, I can't, I can't share the details of that back and forth between the township and Fair Share Housing Center, who we are, we continue to be and were at that time in negotiations with. But what I can say is that was a specific compliance item that was included in our settlement agreement in order to uh, achieve uh, a better global settlement for the township as deemed by the township committee members at that time, specifically seeking to reduce densities as part of our unmet need overlay zone. And Fair Share Housing Center sought a uh, a project that had certainty for the production of affordable housing in exchange for lower densities. And so with a 100% affordable housing project like we have here on the DPW site that has certain timing requirements and certain obligations to be constructed, as opposed to simply inclusionary housing where it's at the whim of the market of the developers involved. And so that is how our negotiation uh, was structured. Fair Share Housing Center looking for certainty for faster production of affordable housing, the township looking for reduced density, and this is and, and this is the result. The overlay zones that Graham provided in his presentation and the 100% affordable housing project. The other aspect of the question is what other municipalities in New Jersey have unmet need projects with 75 or more affordable house, 100% uh, affordable housing units? I can't identify one, although uh, to be honest, I can't say that there isn't one across the state. I certainly, I simply haven't surveyed all settlement agreements and housing plans in order to determine uh, to what extent Milburn may stand alone on this topic. Vernon's for all is almost 75 69. Uh, That's a darn good. Hi, my name is Eric Osterman. I'm a 30 year resident of Milburn Short Hills. Um, I did not 
expect to have to say this, but Ms. McManus, what you just basically admitted was that you gave away the dump site, nine, two, 10, whatever number you want to attach to it, Main Street, okay? You gave it away. I don't even know if it was asked for, and that shows some pretty poor negotiation, okay? Um, second, that was a comment, but second, um, as a resident, it offends us all to, as residents, it offends us all to hear that there was a court order in this case, which distinguishes it from any other case. Now, the court order was issued supposedly because the town residents had an opportunity to be heard. The settlement agreement contains a confidentiality clause. That clause pertains to the negotiations. Once there was an agreement between, orally, between Ms. McManus and her crew of negotiators and fair share housing, there was no open hearing like this before the pen went to the paper. So to say that there was an opportunity to be heard and an order was issued is an outright fallacy, okay? And I don't know why the seven of you in front of us tonight, you know, can't admit that basically this town was deprived of due process in this process. I mean, let, let's, let's call a spade a spade. That's what happened here. We were deprived of due process. There was no input, okay? We already have a gigantic traffic jam every single day on Main Street. I'm calling it the Maggie Miggins honorary traffic jam. She's not dead yet, so we can't call it the Maggie Miggins, Mayor Maggie Miggins Memorial Traffic Jam. And when you guys are done, it's just going to be even worse. Okay? So my first question is, was there an, a proper opportunity to be heard by town residents, and when did that occur? Okay? That's really what I want to know. And was it before or after the signatures of our crack township committee went on the piece of paper obligating this town to move forward? Can't answer. We already had the rest of the money. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, Falcon was in the room. Wasn't your firm in the room, Mr. Madrid? Yeah. So it, it's my understanding that um, the resolution that authorized the township committee to enter into a settlement agreement was done at a public publicly held meeting, um, and there was public input. Um, and the resolution was on the agenda that night. That's my understanding. Do you have a date, have a date of that yeah. meeting? I will. No, but that's no. There was a July thirtieth hearing, August seventeenth. What have I done? The resolution passed. Yes, I was the only person in the room on July thirtieth. That was after the ink went on the piece of paper, right? There was no opportunity to be heard. If you were there and you didn't tell us the terms till after the approval. The, 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 settlement, the settlement was approved and the terms of the settlement were presented after the settlement was approved. That's yeah. you can watch the meeting. That's what happened. Yeah. Yeah. Just, just told the public that we did not know the terms until after you approved. It. And that, so that, there was that, no that, due that, process. Look, I get no it. due process. I, that's what happened here. It, and now we have a negative rate of return on a project, okay? And that's just the nine main street okay. that we're gonna lose money on. We haven't gotten to the other ones. Thank you. I okay? I would like I'd to like to see to the discounted cash flow analysis that was done here to, for the town. It wasn't done. This is a negative project. 
with no due process. Good job, guys. Thank you. Thank you. Good job. Thanks. My name is Frank Sagan. So I think we've seen tonight that a lot of people are very upset for a variety of reasons. Right. Um, clearly, a lot of people have a lot of opinions. There's a lot of criticism. Um, believe me, there's a lot more criticism that could be levied against these folks. But I think that had we had this type of format, if we had one of these meetings before the agreement was agreed upon, then we probably could have avoided all of this unpleasantness that we've been going through for the past year plus. Um, so we heard tonight, uh, Alex McDonald admitted that the township committee signed the agreement prior to oh, anyone no, no, in town. No, 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 no. Yeah. yeah. I did not say we signed okay, the township so committee signed the agreement. It. I said, and anybody can view that on a on a township committee meeting on YouTube that. A resolution was approved, and after the resolution was approved to settle the terms of Fair Share Housing Center, the, the terms of that were presented by Ms. McManus. I did not say that it was signed by the municipality prior to the approval of the resolution. There is a signature for the okay. is Be Wall. that as, as it may, the problem is a project like this, you should have had several intro sessions before the township committee went to sign anything or approve any resolutions or move forward with the project in any way. So what ended up happening is we had two township committee members that were in the room negotiating with fair share housing. I understand Beth McManus may have been there for some of it as well. Um, and Mayor Maggie Miggins and former committee uh, member Richard Wasserman negotiated on behalf of the town. And since no one knew this was going on, they just had to rely on their own instincts. And for reasons unbeknownst to us, I, I really wish the mayor were here, so I'd like her to explain why she decided to build 75 units of income segregated housing, which is essentially like it's redlining. I mean, for a lack of a better term, it is redlining. We're putting disadvantaged people all together in a 100% affordable settlement. And if you look at what's going on in cities across the country, they're tearing down 100% uh, income segregated projects. You see that on the news, they implode the, the projects, and then what do they put in its place? They put inclusionary housing, where you're mixing affordable units uh, along with um, market rate units. And that's the right way to do affordable housing. What we should be doing is putting the folks that are you know, economically disadvantaged in a community, and we want to surround them by folks of different socioeconomic backgrounds, and that helps lift everyone up. Everyone gets to learn from one another, and that's the right way to do affordable housing. That's not what was done here. So I really do wish the mayor would explain why she thought it would be a good idea to redline these folks on the dump. The other thing that I take issue with is this project didn't need to happen at all. See, we had already satisfied our RDP. So our RDP is what has to be built. And this was above and beyond that. This was to satisfy unmet need. Now, most towns satisfy unmet need with overlay zone. And we did some of that here. Um, they could have done more. There's no reason that we couldn't have had another overlay zone or increase the density of an overlay zone by 75 units. We would have avoided this contentious project, this project that is going to segregate and isolate those which it was designed to help. And to me, I think that's appalling because as Milburn, we should be leaders in the state. We have some of the brightest people in the state here and we should be doing affordable housing right. What was done here is the wrong way to do it. And you know, it's just really unfortunate that the town continues to defend their actions, and I find that disappointing. So, thank you. All right, I'm just going to ask that we continue to, to uh, you know, limit. We have a couple of people online that I want to get to, so I think we have three waiting here. And Why do you take the people on? No, no, no. Go ahead. No, so I'm going to take no, time. No, no. All right. Oh, oh. Well, again, my name is Shepard Feld. I was in the room on July 30th, 2021. I was the only resident in the room. Um, can we possibly go back to the chronology slide that Graham did? Because I think people need to know history. Because the real first magic date occurred in March 2015, when the state Supreme Court took back all responsibility of affordable housing. And for about two years, I've been asking, why did it take us 
until April 2018 to follow our declaratory judgment, where the court said you had a three months and we should have filed it in July 2015. Had we filed that case at that time, what would have been our BLA RDP number? It would have been much lower. And a lot of things we're hearing now, we're a cutting edge of law. When we hear the word builders remedy immunity, that's gone out the door because of what's happened in Madison and the case that's going on in Livingston. Because when people are looking at the settlements that were done, they're saying, what was your RDP number? Because we were not farmland, we were a fully developed community. And they said, when you put in your RDP number, did you exclude certain properties? Because that's what's happening in Drew University. That's what's happening in Livingston, saying a developer's getting the property. Now it's coming in. I want to develop it. It should be now included in your RDP number. Had we done that originally, we probably would not have seen Silverman. So the, the burdens would have shifted to Silverman, and he says. What's been very interesting tonight, no one's talked about Woodmont. How did a project that's dependent on state approval to sell properties next to the Canoebrook Reservoir ever get to be an unmet bonus project? Had the community known that they were going to put 200 units next to the reservoir. So what happened at the Rose Garden? We would have been up here with pitchforks and torches stopping them. <laughs> so that's what we are. It is due process. We were not told the terms. We heard it tonight, everyone, for the first time. They never told us the terms of the settlement until after the fact. Ms. McManus came on the scene in the middle of July. She was only involved for about two or three weeks till the settlement occurred. She talked about we got lower densities. Everyone go back to look at our original proposal of April 2018. Compare the densities in that agreement to what we agreed to. We agreed to increase many of the densities 300%. That's where we are being taken as fools. I don't like to be called a fool. As to expertise, I'm the only one in this town probably in the state that was sued by RDP for standing in a public forum and accusing them of doing a deal where they originally told us we would pay fair market value and ended up being a dollar sale. I was the subject of a slap suit. As we talked about what we have accomplished, in November 2021, the DCA just issued a handbook for pilots. Why did that occur? It's because of all my litigation. There's litigation going on challenging whether that 6.28% has been revoked by the state legislature in April 2000, um, 1992. But the key is today is we've all heard it today, we were not afforded due process. I am the pro bono counsel of concerned Milton residents. If you're offended by what happened here tonight, write to the judge tomorrow morning. My name is Debbie Frank. I've been here a resident since uh, 1980, a while. My uh, husband actually graduated from the high school. Um, I'm on the end, other end of this, on the other side of this. I don't have a problem with this project. And part of the reason is that um, I am the product of uh, a, a divorced woman with six kids who got no alimony, who had intermittent is putting it kind, child support, and who worked uh, as an entry level clerk for the state of New York. My siblings and I all went to college. Most of us have graduate degrees. Everybody did fine. These people are not necessarily disadvantaged. These people don't have the same amount of income. I feel as though the state of New Jersey, like a lot of places, in this country has become so economically segregated. And it has nothing to do with who these people are. It has to do with what their income is, what their jobs pay. I, I, I feel like you know this project, because it's 100% affordable, gives, us, gives them more opportunity to come here more opportunity to have a part in what 
this township is built in terms of its school system. I, I can't help but see this as a good thing. And I did want to say, although it wasn't brought up tonight, that um, it has been mentioned a, a lot of times about uh, it being, think, oh, by the way, it's, it's not red line. That, that's a whole different thing. But about a stigmatism, about a stigma being attached to the people who would move into this project, move into this building, it, the people don't come in with a stigma. The stigma comes from how they're received by the community, community into which, which they move. I, for one, and I know that I'm in the minority here, um, yeah. but I do indeed believe that this is not a bad thing. Thank you. Hi, uh, thanks for giving us the opportunity. And I, I know we waited a really long time and I do agree with the sentiment, having been at every meeting for the last three years practically, that we really have not been heard as a community. And I think we would appreciate an apology and an acknowledgement of that tonight before we all leave here. Um, I just want to address Debbie. Uh, I don't think there's a single person in this room that moved to Milburn that doesn't agree that we should welcome every person who wants to live here as, as we've all been welcomed. It's just not true. There's nobody I know here especially the people that have been coming, meeting after meeting to try and understand what's going on here, to make sure that those people get the same opportunities that we all have had for our kids and ourselves. What we're worried and very concerned about is there's been no planning for anything, particularly our schools. We came here, every one of us, for the quality of the schools here, and they're going to be decimated. We all know that. Everybody knows it. Why can't we just say it out loud and say, particularly with the pilot that the gentleman doing the finance uh, talk didn't even mention that none of that money will go to our schools. So how are we going to maintain the quality of our schools that we are all holding up so highly and the reason we all came here without even mentioning that? It's not right. It's disingenuous and it's almost really misleading to the community. I am speaking to you, sir, on this subject. So um, the other thing I'd like to mention is um, there's two more things. One is um, we, we actually did get probably the worst deal in the state, Beth. I think that, that you have to acknowledge that. I mean, there are facts that support that. We ended up with 75% of our unmet need while most other communities got 20 30. I mean, nobody got anywhere close to 75%. Why did we end up with that high number? What happened? Why did we, as you say, throw something in to get a better deal when we got the worst deal? Please explain that. We are all really smart people here. We just don't want to be misled like that. It's not right. Can you pay attention? And then the last thing I'd like to mention is I recall reading in the newspaper around this time that that uh, our, the, the um, uh, dump project, whatever, nine main was being talked about. And, and what it said was the governor had placed about $300 million or more in his budget toward 100% affordable housing projects. And one of the dozen or so that were specifically mentioned in that newspaper article where he was quoted was nine Main Street, and it was described as a shovel-ready project, which tonight, you agree, isn't even close to that. So was there any influence placed by the governor's office for this township to include that project? I'd like to know the, the answer to that. Was that coincidental? Um, I think that's it. Thank you. A couple of the uh, so a couple of the questions that were asked is uh, I think the easy question is was there any gov uh, governor influence? The answer is no. Uh, I've never spoken or heard of anybody speaking with the governor's office uh, during the settlement negotiations for this project. Uh, the other more broad topic uh, question was uh, about the the deal generally. Uh, and why that again, another another way to ask why is the 75 unit project in the townships unmet need? 
And one other, one other aspect that folks may not be fully clear about is the fact that when the township was tasked with settling with Fair Share Housing Center, we were tasked via an order on August 2nd to settle by August 17th. And so you might think that at that point that we were close to settlement negotiation, settlement being completed, and that's that's unfortunately not the reality. The township had a very short window in order to complete its settlement negotiations or risk losing immunity, which uh, your municipal officials deemed to be a worse consequence than the settlement that was available to them that they could have settled with Fair Share Housing Center. And I can't under I can't underscore the influence or the impact on the lack of leverage on settlement negotiations for this municipality. We were tasked with settling, completing those settlement negotiations over a very short amount of time. And we did so being late to the game, meaning that we did not file in 2015. In fact, the township filed after we were sued for a builder's remedy. So this was not a volunteer voluntary compliance action uh, in the strictest sense. It was uh, sort of a coerced and then voluntary uh, compliance action. And all of those factors, the lack, the timing for the settlement, the timing for the negotiations and the lack of leverage are huge influences for how the township got to where, got to its settlement. Just quickly going back to uh, Mr. Feld's question about Woodmont. I think the, the very simple answer to that is that Woodmont looked to intervene in in our settlement and the courts allowed it. That's that's the, we objected to it and the courts allowed it. We denied the intervention. That's fact. I'm Elaine Becker. And I want to ask a question about uh, the town yard. Um, I've, I've never heard anything unless I missed something somewhere about where is the town yard going to go uh, to create the uh, the land for this 75 unit uh, affordable housing. And if we don't know where it is going, why in the world would we have given up this property if we don't know where the town yard is going? We have looked at it over the years. And we went out Parsons Hill Road, we looked in places out there and we said, we really can't go there. And we never had a place to go. And I'm wondering where is the town yard going to go if this project moves forward? Thank you. Uh, at this point in time, the portion of the yard that would be displaced by the, by the, by the development would be moved to JFK Parkway, the leaf composting site. Mr. Cosner? The leaf composting site, yeah. you just, you, we're, we're changing our operations. In other words, right now, what we do as a municipality is we take all of your leaves and we put them up at JFK and we have uh, people that go up there and they turn leaf piles and they do that for eight, to six to seven mulch months. For mulch. Yes, but that's no longer, used to be a, used to be something that we were able to sell. Uh, that is no longer the case. Uh, that is now taken um, from the municipality when we, when we do all that work to compost it. Um, so there are regional facilities, which is actually what the DEP is pushing municipalities to, to no longer have a composting facility because of the stringent requirements on composting sites. So larger places like Rotundi, where you see at the intersection of South Orange Avenue and Cherry Lane or Brookside, um, or uh, Peterscape or different places like that are now going to start taking over those few municipalities that do still compost their leaves. So it costs us now to operate that. Even, even as it's operating now, it costs us. Uh, this is going to be our last individual in the room because we do have five people that have. I'll make it short too, and it's Dave Cosgrove. Uh, a question for Ms. McMahon is based on, on a statement that you just made that there was a September 2 board order. August. Oh, August, sorry, August 2 board order. Um, I've looked for that and I've never been able to find that. Um, so, is it a written order? Was it signed by the judge? You know, where can we get a copy of that, please? I apologize if I misspoke. It might have been court direction dated August 2nd as opposed to a written court direction. What was court direction? 
Just, just to be clear, uh, sort of on the timeline of events is that also, and I think this, some of this information is on the township website, which you can go and view as um, under affordable housing, but there was a, um, and I think Mr. Cosgrove. Oh, I know, right here. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, there is a, so I'm sorry, there, I don't mean to interrupt you, but there is a court order. It's dated August 2nd, 2021. Uh, it states, uh, I, I don't want to read the full order for folks because it's a few pages. Uh, but it says, uh, item number two, the parties and participants, Milburn, shall formally ratify, authorize, and execute the settlement agreement without condition on or before August 17, 2021. Again, that's an order dated August 2, 2021, executed by uh, Judge Robert Gardner. So there was a problem on July 30. Thank, Thank you. All right. We do have a few people on, online. And so um, we're going to see how this goes as it is our first uh, first attempt. So, uh, Mr. Sharp. Oh. Oh. Hello, do you see me? We don't see you. We're, you don't need to put your camera on in this session. Okay. okay. Uh, I, I'm Josh Scharf. I've been a resident for 30 years, and uh, I haven't been to a township meeting for a while. Uh, but, uh, Tina, one of the things that I do want uh, to point out is that the negotiations that shows our RPM was done by a selected committee of two that included Mayor Miggins and Mr. Wasserman. Mayor Miggins, uh, of course, chose herself for the committee. Um, as I've brought out a number of times, and I've questioned um, the Township Committee and Mr. Marizadi uh, Zidi was there at the time, uh, there's a conflict, there's an obvious conflict. Uh, Maggie Miggins is a realtor here in town. She shouldn't be involved in this kind of process. And the notion that she selected herself to select who was going to be the developer is wrong, just very, very wrong. Just as an aside, my wife never attends these meetings. The one meeting that she did attend uh, was the meeting that RPM presented. And my wife noticed that in the course of the meeting, uh, Maggie Miggins uh, flashed a big smile and a wink towards Ed Mark Toglio, who's the president of RPM. The whole thing just felt very uncomfortable. Uh, so I, I do want to go back to Mr. Marizidi, who invoked his father, who was uh, the late uh, Republican senator from uh, the state of New Jersey, uh, when he was talking about conflict, as to why didn't council realize that there was a conflict and uh, have uh, Ms. Miggins recuse herself from any of these discussions? Who else was considered? And, I'm sorry, one other thing is who else, was, who, else, who else was considered in this RPM? Why weren't their uh, proposals presented at all? Thank you. Well, the, uh, to answer the last question first, uh, uh, it came down to, as I recall, uh, a decision between L&M and RPM. And it was a very uh, robust conversation between the two of them. The final decision about RPM was voted on uh, by resolution of the Township Committee to choose RPM. It was not a choice of Maggie Miggins or Mr. Wasserman alone. Was just, and I'd like to clarify a little bit because I think that I think that the the group of uh, the two committee members that were working on affordable housing, in particular the the 75 uh, units and the developer, was a resolution, and it was included uh, Diane Eggler. I just I just want to be clear. <laughs> Yeah. 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 The other question with respect to the conflict, I have addressed that before with this gentleman and described the, the response that stated. <coughs> no. uh, uh, in my opinion, there is not a conflict. 
although she is a realtor, she's not engaged in marketing uh, low moderate income housing at all. It's not a focus of her role as a realtor. I do not believe this. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Rick. Yes, I just wanted to ask the question about have we considered the long term risk that Milburn is taking in placing 75 families on an EPA contaminated site? Is that is that your only question, ma'am? That is it. Thank you. Uh, this is Joe Marazzini. Uh, I, I have referred to this prior. Uh, there will be a cleanup, a remediation of that site to meet the DEP residential standards. That is something that is done routinely throughout the state of New Jersey. I personally have been involved in projects in the city of Hoboken, in the city of Perth Amboy, and other places where there are residential, high-end residential projects that are on sites that were once contaminated. Uh, this site uh, will be one of those that will be fully remediated in accordance with those requirements and perhaps beyond those requirements. Ms. Brazil? Yes, hi. Um, so I see we're trying to make do on the areas we have essentially failed to meet the affordable housing on net needs due to Mount Laurel back in 1983. Once the compliance hearing is over, what are our plans? For the future to make sure that we continue to meet requirements so that we are making decisions due to lawsuits. Oh, sorry. So once the township completes implementation of the various uh, zoning and projects that Graham went through, meaning adoption of ordinances, uh, following through with each of the steps for the 75 unit 100% project, the, the township's obligated to uh, one, uh, uh, work with developers that are making site plan applications that are consistent with the zoning in place. So for example, those overlay zones, presumably some property owners will decide to redevelop their sites. So the township will be obligated to work with them. Uh, in terms of uh, sort of readying itself for the fourth round in the future, one of the other terms of the township settlement agreement will be really helpful in that regard, and that is adoption of a mandatory set aside ordinance. That is an ordinance that states, for any generally, for any uh, multifamily project that is approved in the township that is not otherwise part of the overlay zones or any of the other affordable housing projects, for any of these uh, multifamily projects that are approved, the township is obligated to include an affordable housing set aside. So, what does that mean? Let's say uh, a developer brings forward an application to the Board of Adjustment, requests a use variance for multifamily housing, let's say uh, 50 units, just as a, a random number. That ordinance requires that the Board of Adjustment, if it approves the application, is obligated to require an affordable housing set aside be included as part of the application. It does not mean that they are obligated or they have to approve the application, but simply if they do, they include an affordable housing set aside. And that's important because one, it's required for our settlement agreement, but more specific to the question, that those are projects that come the fourth round and in the future when the court looks back on Milburn and says, well, what, what have you been doing since you settled, since you adopted your housing plan? The township can say, well, we've had X number of applications for multifamily housing that have been approved and hopefully all of them include the affordable housing set aside as part of the mandatory set aside ordinance. And that will be helpful to ensuring compliance and making sure that we we don't get behind, so to speak, on our affordable housing obligation. Thank you. Uh, Phil, Mr. Kirsch. Uh, hi, this is Phil Kirsch. Um, <clears throat> I know uh, a woman spoke not too long ago who was in favor pretty much of the nine Main Street project and the affordable housing as we've, as we've uh, put it forward. And she mentioned that uh, she was in the minority and she may be in the minority, she may not. There's a very vocal majority or a very vocal minority, which is, has come out criticizing this whole plan, many facets of it. But I'm part of the group 
which could well be a majority who does favor the plan overall. I mean, there are a few things in background. I mean, I remember um, when I asked Mayor Tillotson, I think how long ago that was, maybe 10 years ago, at a township committee meeting, um, if our town had made any plans after the court rulings to put forth our plan with the courts for affordable housing. And he said we hadn't yet. And I think that I myself and a lot of the other residents who now are objecting that we kind of fell down on the job because we didn't pressure our representatives, our elected committee members enough to make sure we kept this in the forefront um, when it was much more advantageous. So we all have to take responsibility for that. I think we also have to take responsibility for not sharing this ideal community we live in, which is kind of growing out of the Short Hills ideal community that Hartshorn started. Um, and we kind of built an economic wall around it. So I think it is time to, sh to share fairly. And as far as the nine Main Street, uh, there are a few things. One thing, I don't think that fair share housing, they're very sensitive to lower income, so-called lower income families. And I think if they felt there was any problem with putting them together, that they would not favor that. I also think that if we did not do something like that, the way I think that Princeton has done also, um, if you're gonna have 20% set aside and you're gonna meet these 75 units, you have to build 375 units. Now, are the people who object to this plan, are they gonna be happy with that? Um, I also do agree with what that woman said previously, and it's true that these are not destitute people who are going to live there. There are people who normally couldn't afford to live in this town. There are people who likely, people who work here, who can't afford to live here, now they can live and work here. Um, so I think all those things should be taken into account. And I frankly don't understand this big tumult about the fair share housing, the picking after the fact and all these details because Milburn was in a very tough situation because we let it get into that situation. We did what a lot of affluent towns did and just kicked the can down the road and we're paying a price for it. I also think that my understanding is we're meeting barely the minimum now, we're not uh, settling or giving in to more units than we need to have. So that's basically my viewpoint on the issue. Thank you. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Ladies, done. Violating the plaintiff's rules. Better to oh, your mouth. Mr. Dunn. Oh, Hi, Nancy Stone, 10 Fielding Road in Short Hills. I am absolutely outraged with some of the comments that are being made tonight. One of them that with the previous gentleman just saying that it's time to share. We live in a very generous community. We give a lot of money. This town gives a lot of money. We pay a lot of taxes. And quite frankly, the term of kick the can down the road, I, I'm so sick of that terminology because the people that kick the can down the road protected this community from this outrageous agreement that Wasserman and Miggins signed, who crapped in the can ultimately, and they crapped on Milburn, and they did not act in the best interest of Milburn. And the woman who thinks that children will not be stigmatized, that you live on a dump, is in denial how cruel some kids can be nowadays, and the type of kids that unfortunately are exposed to the internet and all the bullying that goes on. I've said it before and I've said it again. This kicking the can down the road is an outrage. They protected our town from this demise that these people in leadership are taking us down. I am a resident here over 30 years. There's a reason why lawyers, big lawyers did not wanna even represent Milburn and Jared Cantor, who ended up taking it and is billing us through the nose. For what? I don't understand because he's supposed to be representing us. He's representing the special interest that does not have the resident's best interest at heart. And again, they're crapping in the can and I'm sick of it. 
I have not spoken in a long time, but after hearing the, the defense that we were not given the opportunity to participate in any capacity, and these documents were signed without any public not knowledge and just resolutions passed. And now you're coming to the table because court orders are gonna be issued. And thank God for Jeff Felt, who is pouncing every day. And these diligent people like Frank and Jerry, Dr. Kong, that is out there fighting every day and all the same minority as that previous person. We might be a, a loud minority, but we're effective because we're getting credible people to step up and finally say what is happening and continuing to say what's happening. And the lawyers that are representing Milburn should all be sued for malpractice because they did not represent Milburn in the best interest. And yes, we're an affluent community and we shouldn't have to feel guilty for working hard for our money to be wasted by you people. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Diane? Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, this is Diane Eglow. I was not going to speak, but Alex, since you mentioned my name, I figured I should just call in. Um, I vehemently was opposed to this plan that's going up the RPM. And I was absolutely along with committee woman Prupus in favor of L and M's plan, because that was a comprehensive plan that would have taken into account the entire area. This plan, this building that RPM is putting forward, there's, it's not the right plan. It will not function properly. There's a lot of things that are wrong with what's going on but I can say the starting point is their building. So I'm gonna hang up. And this is the other problem with having this at the library. They have a hard stop. I think you should have these meetings at town hall where you control the timing of the meetings and when the lights get off. Thank you. Can you please use it? Hello? Hi, can you hear me? Hello? Yes, can you hear you? Hi, Marilee Respect, uh, 91 Whittingham Terrace. I've lived in this community for more than 60 years. So all of you latecomers with 30 years, I've got you double that. Anyway. I'd like to say that uh, I agree with most of what uh, Debbie Frank and Phil Kirsch said. Um, there are many of us in this community, and there are three of us sitting here in this room with me that agree uh, that this is this project is not the horror show that this uh, very vocal minority is constantly shouting about. I'd also yeah. like to point out that two of the speaker, two of the people that called in during public comment tonight are candidates for township committee. Republican candidates, and another one has sued the town oh, four or five times, I think. Anyway, um, we need to we need to comply with this agreement, and I hope that the judge will uh, make that ruling this week at the settlement hearing. Enough is enough. Let's stop all the bitching. Thanks. <laughs> um, at this point, we have time for one more. Chris H. Hello. Hey, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, so this is Chris He at 8 Parkview Drive. So uh, we moved to Milburn probably eight years ago. So we're a fairly young family and with the young kids. Um, so what we concern and we really care about is the school system apparently. Um, I just have a question. Um, has any study or evaluation been done uh, for what's going to happen if there's hundreds of new units, new family, assuming hundreds of new uh, students come into town, and uh, if one, um, the school can afford them. Two, um, what, what is, I just don't understand. I don't get it how 
uh, our school can handle all of them. Or is that any is that in the decision process at all? Thank you. Yeah. Um, so so again, the there there the, there was a um, description of 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 nine Main Street and what those seventy five units um, may produce. And but from a holistic standpoint, with the affordable housing settlement. Um, all this information has been shared with the schools and we've been discussing with the schools what that impact may be and where in, in, individual developments would in particular go to elementary school, looking at enrollment rates um, in the schools, which are currently less than what they were previously. Um, and so understanding <clears throat> how those school how those school children would be distributed um, among the in particular five elementary schools um, in, the, in the municipality. So there has been um, a look at this and sort of at this point, the school, to, to my knowledge, and I don't want to speak for them, but have not raised any alarms in terms of well, what this, uh, what this is, what, what these uh, developments may produce. But, but again, I mean, the Upton um, is 193 units with 30 uh, affordable units. And so that is a certainly a bit of a litmus test for the municipality, although it is a little bit more removed um, and um, is an inclusionary development, but um so yes there has been some so in other words the school is not prepared there's no remedial tutors there to make sure these guys so i think that one and this was said by mr stoller earlier and i just I, I i think that it's i think i think i i find it very interesting too and i maybe i shouldn't say this but everybody's making a really strong assumption that the individuals that are going to be moving into these units are not smart so so with that thank you everybody good night good night